Hello everybody and welcome to the Wednesday edition of Video Clips and I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about something that I think is significant it has to do with censorship. Um, the evidence against current policies and some of the um, data concerning this COVID-19 issue is, um, is it, it, it really continues to mount. And uh, one of the problems is that people who speak out against any of this often find that their articles and videos are taken off of social media. And um, YouTube removed the video of two doctors in a very long discussion. They were questioning the policies, they were questioning the data, and um, certainly saying a lot of things about the lockdowns not being so good. Um, Facebook and Twitter are doing the same thing. And in fact, um, YouTube CEO, uh, Susan Wojcicki, I think is her name, uh, said that anything that would go against World Health Organization recommendations is a violation of policy. And I find that very interesting. We live in the United States. We are supposed to have freedom of speech. Um, we have a Bill of Rights that guarantees that, except that I guess if you say anything contrary to what the World Health Organization says, then you don't have free speech anymore. And um, that's truly unfortunate and very concerning and something that we'll need to work on at some point in time. But the reason I bring it up is I first want to talk about what the doctors talked about because I think it's important and I've condensed it down to a, just a summary that I think will be easier for you to digest. But the other thing is, is one could get the impression that most people agree with what's going on. And I think that there's a sizable population of people who don't agree, but you don't hear from them as much. And one of the reasons you won't hear from them as much is that they get taken down. All right. So anyway, just a few things I'll remind you as I give you some of these data that things change. Um, from the date that a video is recorded, but, but nothing is changing in terms of the overall idea. In other words, I said this yesterday, cases go up, deaths go up, the percentage stays the same. There's no reason to make adjustments about what we're saying, the big ideas that we're sharing here. So the two doctors are California doctors who own, I think it's seven clinics and they're emergency room docs, well-trained in microbiology and immunology, and they really question whether or not science is being followed. And we should all be able to question everything in our country. I think it's our job to question our elected officials. It's our job to question the health profession. I mean, some of the strategies that are being used here, we have some good reasons to ask questions. If you're gonna ruin somebody's life, you probably ought to have a good reason for doing it. The hospitals are empty. They're furloughing doctors in California. That's going on all over the country. This is not unique to California, and they're not the only doctors who are saying it. Um, while this is going on, people who have real conditions like co you know, uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer can't get treatment, are afraid to go to the hospital. The hospitals have basically been closed, and, and um, I think tomorrow Ohio might be opening up May 1st to allow some procedures within limitations. But We've had a lot of members that were terrified that they couldn't get treatment that they needed. Um, but anyway, the, the doctors say, listen, the initial models were awful. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. They were awful. They were off by a lot. Millions of deaths were predicted. And some of those models even calculated what would happen if we social distanced and all the stuff that we're doing. And they still said millions would die. They were clearly wrong. We have better data. I'm going to share it with you. So the doctors talked about their own testing. They, they did this themselves. They tested 5,213 people in Kern County. And their results showed that about 6.5% of the population actually had been exposed to the virus. It means widespread viral infection has already taken place. And this has been shown in other um, uh, research done by other groups. This is what the Stanford group showed, the Los Angeles data I shared with you last week, the New York data I shared with you last week. It all comes out the same. We should pay attention to that. Um, in the state of California, uh, 280,000 uh, tests uh, roughly uh, administered, 33,865 COVID cases. It means that probably 12% of the whole population of the state have had it, and there are 39.5 million people in California, which means you're looking at 4.7 million roughly cases. It's widespread. 1,227 deaths in California out of what's estimated to be 4.7 million cases means that a person in California has a 0.03% chance of, uh, of dying from COVID and almost all people are recovering. Don't even have to visit doctors or hospitals, right? The more you test, the more positives you get. The prevalence goes up. And the death rate goes down and they emphasized this as they were reviewing the data for many many countries and they did this for they shared data from new york similar to what i shared last week um, and i'll give you the u.s data in a minute here but but one of the things they kept repeating throughout the video was millions of cases 
a very small percentage of death. In other words, people would be a whole lot less frightened if they heard this message more often. Millions of cases, very tiny percentage of people dying. In the United States, now again, don't say, well, I know it's over a million now, I'm talking about, but it hasn't changed. The ratios haven't changed. 802,590 cases. They tested over 4 million people around the United States. This is twice as many as any other country. So people are screaming about testing. We have done twice as much as any other country on the planet. What we found is 19.6% of the population has probably been exposed, which means we have 64 million cases in the United States. Now, before you get all sideways, um, it's very similar to the flu. It's what happens every year. Every year we get 37 to 67,000 cases. It varies from year to year and it's always hard to get accurate data because you're not always sure what people have died from. Uh, but um, again, if you look at, um, at this consistently, millions of cases, very small percentage of death. Um, in terms of, um, I think, the main points that they made that were the reason for the censorship, one of the things I think we should spend more time on, is that there are secondary effects from all this that are going on. Uh, child molestation is increasing. Angry, intoxicated family members who are home without any money, and that's just going to get worse. This will affect these kids for the rest of their life, not for a season. Spousal abuse, the effect is for a lifetime. Alcoholism, anxiety, suicide. I've reported before, we have a lot of suicides and drug overdose deaths here in the United States or here in uh, central Ohio uh, and all over Ohio. Um, a significant kids, percentage of kids are not schooling at home. So our kids were not doing well before this. So not going to school. I can't imagine anybody thinking this is a good idea right now. Economic collapse. I mean, the medical industry has no staff, no volume. They're, they're, people are looking for jobs outside healthcare because they have to feed their families. And um, these kinds of things affect people for a lifetime, not a season. According to the CDC, deaths, 24 to 62,000 deaths from flu each year, 45 million cases in 2017 with 62,000 deaths, a 0.13% chance of death, 0.02% with COVID, the death rate is actually much lower. And the doctors reported the same thing that we have heard from many people, which is that many physicians are very disturbed about the fact that they've been, been instructed to um, code these, uh, to mark on the death certificate, death from COVID, even if the person got hit by a bus, okay? And by the way, all these deaths that, that are being reported, we're giving them the benefit of the doubt because the, the I mean, Dr. Burks got on television, one of the six o'clock briefings one day, and actually said that if the person dies with COVID, but actually died of something else, you code it on the death certificate as death from COVID. So even with that uh, factored in, um, we're still seeing a very low death rate from COVID. One concern that they expressed is that the immune function of the human body is built by exposure to viruses and bacteria. When children are born, we don't put them in bubble wrap and sequester them away. We try to expose them to as many things as possible because this is how they build their immunity. Humans are used to sharing bacteria and developing and strengthening their immune systems every single day. When you wash all the time, you clean all the time, you shelter in place, you're weakening the immune system. Social distancing weakens the immune system. To have a normal immune system, people need to interact with one another. When we come out of shelter in place, the disease rate will spike for many, many different things because immune systems have gotten weaker. In the meantime, the hospital systems are weaker and the doctors are on furlough. It's just not good for a healthy society. The doctors were asked, is, is Anthony Fauci wrong? And they didn't really want to get into that. They just basically say, first of all, we're doctors and we see patients every day. And there's a difference between, and I've talked about this for years, the academic discussion of some of these things versus the type of discussion that goes on when you're actually dealing with people. Fauci is clearly an academic. The original data, they say, was theoretical and based on studies about coronavirus since the 1970s. And every year when we get the flu, it's a new virus. Viruses mutate. That causes increased or decreased virulence. Anytime there's something new in the medical community, there's a lot of fear and caution. We've never responded like this before. So why are we doing this now? And um, looking at theories and models is different than real life too, just like academics and real practice is very different and they pointed that out. Um, theory and reality are just not always the same and I think we're seeing that here. Six to eight weeks is all that's gone by. We've crippled the economy, we've created these social issues. 
and really we have to ask is, you know, is was this warranted? You know, if you're going to trounce on constitutional rights, you better have a lot of evidence and not a theory. That's their line, not mine. The shelter in place doesn't make sense. The virus lives for three days on plastic, so it's okay to purchase bottled water and plastic tools. You can go to Costco, but not to church. Go to the store, but not to work. Okay to go to Home Depot, but not to the park when being outside is a healthy thing to do. Gloves don't help because you pick up everything and doctors don't wear masks even in sex, except if they're in the operating room. We didn't shut down for the swine flu or the bird flu. ER docs around the country are saying the same thing. An ER doc is going to an empty hospital in Wisconsin. There are no patients, but somebody in a hazmat suit takes his temperature when he walks in. I mean, there's just something else going on. What's up with that? So what to do now? Here's what the doctors say. The models are not, are not accurate. Let's go back to work. Data, not models, are saying it's time to go back to work. And the data that they shared or what I'm sharing with you here, a lot of what he shared confirmed the data, these doctors shared, confirmed the data that I gave you last week about the California tests and the New York tests. COVID is not a reason why most people are dying. The older population has comorbidities. I mean, if you look at last week's newsletter, the charts could not be more clear. The virus burns out itself or herd immunity. That's the only way that this changes at all. Um, it's true of 97% of the world and the lockdown isn't gonna change it. So the secondary effects are really becoming more significant than a virus that is like flu. And I think we need to make sure it never happens again. And that's what the doctors say too. And we're seeing the secondary effects here. I mean, and what bothers me, I mean, there's so many things that bother me, but some of the people who are involved in this, the health directors, and if you had asked these people um, six months before this all started, what do you think are the consequences of poverty, joblessness, bankruptcy, homelessness, the homeless shelters are going to be full here, for example. Uh, one thing that was in the newspaper earlier this week was the fact that um, there's a moratorium on evictions in, May, in uh, April and May, but June 1st when the courts open up, evictions can go forward. So we're going to have a terrible homeless problem here in central Ohio. So what is the effect of you know, kids who aren't getting an education, uh, joblessness, homelessness, poverty, um, insecure food, and oh my gosh, all these people would have waxed eloquent about how horrible this is, you can't let this happen, we have to come to the rescue and do something, tax people more, whatever it is, and I agree, we should do what we can to fix all that, and here they are inflicting it on people, and it's just hard to fathom how they justify this. I just wonder what these people think about when they go home at night, because when I go home at night, what I think about is how devastating this is. And uh, this comes from somebody who's okay. It's not me who's personally at risk. But I care about my community. I really do. And uh, to see it crumbling around me is, is uh, it's horrible. Um, I pray every week that the restaurants that I love and who I've gotten close to the owners are going to be able to stay in business. I pray every week that uh, there will be uh, less violence and we can get our kids back to school and um, and go back to um, I, I don't know if we can ever go back to normal after this there are people who are terrified and frightened and this has had just a, a permanently devastating effect on many people but the sooner we can start to heal our community and restore our community and and recover from this horrific damage I think the better off we'll be so um, as usual, if you think somebody would benefit from watching this, pass it on. I'm going to have some data on Sweden. I've got a lot of good stuff to share with you tomorrow. So uh, join me again for Thursday's video clips tomorrow.